I'd like to tell you about the strangest secret in the world. They don't come out in so many words and say that they want to take us over. <laughs> They're too clever for that. But that's what they want. They want to take over us, individual me. And if we let them seep in here from down yonder on Cross River, if we let these do-gooders, these bleeding hearts, propagate their insidious doctrine of involvement among us, then, my dear friend, we's in trouble. Deep, deep trouble. You're listening to P.T. Pop on A Mind Revolution. Leading you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. Hey there, everybody. P.T. Pomp here with all four lobes in my brain, securely bound behind my back. And thank you for downloading me today. And I appreciate all of you people who patronage, patronage me. Thank you. And uh, today is a gorgeous day here in Cleveland, Ohio. It is February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day. And it is bright and sunny. And what did they say today in the news and the weather? It was completely clear, I think they said. It doesn't get much clearer than completely clear. But uh, hey, what do you know? Got a special guest for you tonight. Got Joel Terrace, and hello, Joel. Within you, without you, he, you know, he's out of focus. He's the keeper of the microphone. So I am PT Pop, and uh, uh, thank you for tuning, downloading me today. We've got an interesting show. I'm going to be reviewing a book written by a Mr. Ed Sykov. But before I do that, let me let me first tell you about a documentary I just released. It is called Road to Forgiveness. And Road to Forgiveness is a documentary I wrote, directed, filmed, did the whole shoot match. It's all my own. It's a very personal story of being raised by two alcoholic parents in poverty and being homeless and a few other wonderful things that happened like that. And um, Road to Forgiveness is out on YouTube for free. I'll put a link to it. And so you can watch it there. It's only about an hour and 10 minutes long. And I'm real proud of this film. This tells about a, you know, a really good story about my life and my experience being raised by two alcoholic parents. My dad's alcoholism was severe. He was addicted to alcohol, much like many um, heroin addicts are addicted to heroin. Nothing would stand in the way, in the way of him and his next drink. But um, today's show, uh, I'm going to be talking about... The actor and comedian, Peter Sellers. Now, if you're not familiar with Peter Sellers, Peter Sellers is somebody that I grew up watching as a kid. I watched Peter Sellers all the time. I watched his movies, and I thought he was hilarious. But I was a little kid, you know. And, and, and the man I saw on the screen, I thought that was the man he was in real life. I thought he was just funny and charming and hilarious and that kind of stuff. And if you're not familiar with Peter Sellers, let me give you a little bit of background about Peter. Um, let's look over here on his on his on his biography page. But Peter Sellers was a com a comedian and an actor, a radio show um, personality, who got his start in the late 1940s after World War II on a on a BBC radio show called The Goon Show. And then after The Goon Show, he started to make films. And uh, he's most, and he's well known, his, his most popular performance, and he's best known for his performance as per Inspector Clouset uh, on The Pink Panther. He's also played the leading role in Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Cooper's Dr. Strangelove, and his final movie was called Being There. And... Peter Sellers was a guy I just admired and was crazy about as a kid. I just really loved this guy. And I thought he was hilarious, and I thought he was great. Yada, 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 on and on it goes. And uh, the point to my podcast here is that nothing in this world is as it seems. Okay? 
And the thing that I tried to, to put forth, that's a great shot for you guys. You got a, a, the nose of Peter Sellers there. There he is, is Inspector Clouseau. Inspector Clouseau. But in this world, especially in the world of Hollywood now, as, as I've said in other shows, when I say Hollywood, Hollywood encompasses everything. The news media, radio, television, music, uh, movies, anything that's entertainment. And I, I am a person who believes that the news media and Hollywood is all controlled by some nefarious force that has an agenda they're pushing. And one of their, their agendas is to take young minds and to warp them and make them think that things are a certain way in the world. And part of this show is to try to, just, to dispel that myth and to show you that much of what we seek and much what we s s go after and search out in the world is a lie because it's based off of lies. You know, in Hollywood, they, they make it look like you can fall in love with somebody just by seeing, you know, your eyes meet from across a smoky bar room and you float across the floor and you love each other and you get married and live happily ever after. It just doesn't work that way. That's why uh, every other person on the planet gets divorced, or at least in this country. They, they create myths about war. They keep create myths about this country. They create myths about the corporate world. They create myths about athletes. They create myths about anything you could possibly think of. And part of my, I feel my calling is to try to dispel these myths. Because when I was a kid, I believed in all the heroes I grew up admiring. That they were really like they were in the movies, like in real life. I thought Clint Eastwood was a was a tough ass in real life. In his movies, he's one person because he's playing a character. But when I first saw an, an interview with him, like on Barbara Walters or Barbara Wawa or whoever, I uh, was blown away with kind of how sassy he was. You know, he, he didn't seem like the macho kingpin of Hollywood. He seemed like kind of like, well, you know, uh, I make movies, you know, <laughs> And I was like, whoa, this dude's nothing like the character he portrays in the movies. And another thing, I was at a play once. I was in, not in a play, but I was at a play with a friend. And, and the play was called Tony and Tina's Wedding. And in this play is, is the theater uh, is is like theater. It's not in the round, but I don't know what you call it, but where the, where the actors interact with the audience. So there was a scene with a reception where this Tony and Tina got married and Tina's ex-boyfriend showed up to kind of disrupt things. And he was this tough leather jacket wearing cigarette smoking kind of greaser type. Cause I think the movie was, was set in the fifties and he was trying to win Tina back from this dork that she married. And he was this really good looking guy. The actor that played this, this, this tough ex-boyfriend of Tina. And he walks in the room. And he's like, Hey, you know, Hey, you know, he's like, so this you know, is the Stallone, you know, I'm a Tulsa king, you know, I'm a Tulsa king, you know, what do you want? You know, hey, get me my beer, will you? You know? And uh, so my friend, I was with my friend Dawn. And she saw this guy. She's like, oh, my God. He's so gorgeous. <gasps> she was, like, freaking out. Like, she was wetting herself uh, over this guy. She was creaming her panties. And I'm like, okay, whatever, dude. So, so there's intermission. Don's a smoker. We go out in the alley of this theater to for, for Don to have a cigarette. And out walks this actor. <laughs> the guy that plays Tina's ex-boyfriend, the tough greaser guy, you know, the guy like Sylvester Stallone on stage, you know, he's all he's a badass. And he comes out and he walks up to my to my friend Don and goes, Hey girlfriend, you got a light? <laughs> hey. Oh. And she's like, Oh my God, he's so gay. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not mocking the gay people at all. But I'm just saying that in Hollywood, people are playing roles. Whether it's your news anchors, or your musicians, or your actors and actresses, or your voiceover experts, they're all playing a role. Your animators, and they all have agendas. They're given agendas, they're given agendas to push so the public will think one way or the other. So they get some, get, let me get back to Peter Sellers here. This is, this is a book... Written by Ed Sykov. This is called Mr. Strangelove, a biography of Peter Sellers. This is approximately 414 pages, and it's a fascinating book. 
And I find it to be fascinating because I, as a kid, was crazy about Peter Sellers. You know, I walked around high school with my friend Brian, and we'd go, hey, pardon me, do you have a room? Do you have a room? And and I would put sound bites on here from the films. But due to copyright problems, and if I post this on YouTube, I'll get a copyright strike, you know, and the Nazis will be down upon my doorstep saying, why are you paying Peter Sellers movie sound bites? And I don't want to go through that. But this is a great book. And I love Peter Sellers, but part of my duty here in this show is to dispel the myths that we've all been sold, and Peter Sellers is one of them, at least for me. This is a very eye-opening book. Now, to tell you a little bit, of, bit about Mr. Sykov, um, Mr. Sykov is, is an established author. Um He's written books on Sunset Boulevard, The Life and Times of Billy Wilder, Laughing Hysterically, American Screen Comedies in the 1950s, Study Guide for American Cinema, Screwball, Hollywood's Madcap Romantic Comedies. Now, he's, he's a pretty well-known author, and he's somebody that, uh, honestly, and if you're listening, I don't know if you're listening, I, I had not heard of you prior to this, but your book was fascinating. I loved your book, and it was great. So one night I'm sitting there before I made this podcast and I said to my wife, I said, why don't I write to Mr. Sykov and see if you'll be in my podcast? And she's like, well, you never know. Just go ahead and do it. So I wrote a short, polite and sincere email to the man thinking he'd never write back, thinking I'd have to hear from his publicist or something. He'd call me and say, hey, have your guys contact mine, buddy. huh?" But the next day I opened up my email account and there's a reply from Mr. Sykov himself. And I was blown away, number one, that he even responded to me, because I'm no one. I know that. I, you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, a, a big famous star. And he didn't have to, he didn't have to respond to me. And um, it was a very nice email. I'm not going to read the contents of it, but Mr. Sykov disclosed to me that he's very ill. I'm not going to go into the details of his illness. And uh, he wasn't able to appear on the show. And it broke my heart because... Not because he couldn't appear in the show, but I, you know, when you hear that somebody's really sick, for me anyway, you know, you know, it, it hurts because you know someone's out there suffering, somebody who's ta a talented writer like this. And Mr. Sykoff, thank you for the email. Thank you for even responding. And I appreciate it. But um, so back to the book here. Um, so this book is something that I read. And I really enjoyed reading it. It's a long book, but but this is a very well thought out and organized book that's methodically laid out from Mr. Scheller's, well, from his parents to Mr. Scheller's birth to his death. And Peter Sellers, you can, you can find more about Peter Sellers at petersellers.com. I'll also put a link to this book, Mr. Sykov's book, in the description. But Peter Sellers was born Richard Henry Sellers on September 8th of 1925. He died August 24th of 1980. He was a British actor and comedian, and he was winner of the British Academy Award and Gold, 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 Golden Globe Award, and he was nominated for the Academy Award. Um, Peter's initial claim to fame came part of a British comedy team that I had never heard of prior to um, hearing an interview with John Lennon. And John Lennon kept talking about the Goon Show. And I had no idea what, what the Goon Show was. I'm like, what is John talking about the Goon Show? Well, the Goon Show, it aired in the BBC from 1951 until 1960. And he was best known on that role. He played, he played like a variety of characters and voices on there. And it was on the BBC from 51 to 60. And it was a very big hit in the United Kingdom. And it was very off the wall and eccentric and kind of bizarre sense of humor compared to um, the kind of the uptight American slap, not even slapstick. I didn't know what was going on back then, but it was just, you know, a very, very kind of out there kind of humor from what I've heard of it. Uh, you can find excerpts of it on YouTube. He's best known for his role as Inspector Clouseau, Inspector Clouseau in The Pink Panther. And he also played the leading role and two other roles in the movie by Stanley Kubrick, Dr. Strangelove. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a, 
a striking book because this tells the real story of Peter Sellers and what he was really like off camera or off microphone. And how do I know that what Mr. Sykoff says is legitimate is because I've got another book here that is written by Peter Sellers' son, Michael Sellers. And Michael Sellers passed away, I think, in the 80s, or early 90s, but he's no longer with us. And this is called P.S. I Love You by, by Michael Sellers. And Mr. Sykoff's book starts at Peter's birth and ends at his death. This picks up at Peter's death and goes forward. And many of the stories that Mr. Sykoff speaks of in here are mirrored in here, or additional weird stories of Mr. Sellers' life are in here. So, um, Mr. Sellers was married four times. His first uh, wife was Anne Howe. Second wife was Brick Eckland, then Miranda Quarry, and then Lynn Frederick. And, but the time, see, there's a quote on here from, from Peter Sellers' website. It says, by the time the Goon Show was canceled in January of 1960, Peter Sellers had earned the exposure necessary to begin a career in film. After appearing in several British pictures, Sellers achieved success in the U.S. with The Mouse That Roared, 1959. In 1960, he received the international attention. He received international attention for his role in the film *Millionaires*, in which he co-starred with Sophia Loren. Okay, and, and you're like, okay, Pete, I don't know what's the point. What, what do you want to kid, educate us about Peter Sellers? As I said, I want to dispel myths of famous people in Hollywood. And you know, I I, I wrestled with this podcast because this is a big book and this is a big topic. How do I encapsulate or cap, you know, encapsulate a 414-page book into a 40-minute po podcast? I guess the point of it is, is nothing is as it seems. As a huge fan of Peter Sellers, I was honestly shocked what an eccentric, bizarre, violent, paranoid, superstitious man that uh, Peter Sellers was. Um, and there's a variety of ways I can illustrate it, you know, um, but, but his life started off raised by Bill and Peg Sellers. And Peg was an overbearing, doting mother who just was overly protective of her son and overly cautious. And she was someone that let her son do whatever he wanted. He was kind of, in a way he was spoiled. But his first introduction to showbiz happened, bizarrely enough, at the age of two weeks. Okay, And here on page eight of uh, Mr. Sykow's book, Peter Sellers, it says here in the second paragraph, it says, Peter Sellers, a showbiz baby, was carried on stage two weeks into his life by vaudevillian Dickie Henderson, who encouraged the audience to join him in singing, for he's a jolly good fellow. Little Pete instantly burst into tears, and the audience erupted into laughter and applause. For Pete's perspective, this emotional scenario was played out more or less consistently throughout his life until his death in 1980. Now, I can imagine, uh, from what I, I know of my own life, all the tra childhood trauma I experienced shaped me as the man I am today. It molded me and turned me into whoever I am today. And there was a lot of it for me. So so can you imagine the, the subconscious subversion, that, you know, how this is settled into the subconscious and played out in, in his mind later in life? And there's another bizarre thing here where his parents... Took his took um, Peter Sellers. Well, you know, he, let me let me go back to something. I'm going to go back to something here. He was he was born. Um, as Richard Henry Sellers, but here's the weird thing. So so prior to Peter's birth, he had a brother named Peter, who died after being born, and. 
I might be confusing my stories here, but I believe Peter was told by his mother that he had a previous brother named Peter. And he had died. And it just really kind of freaked Peter out as a kid. He heard this as young and, and he, he either legally changed his name to Peter or he adopted the name himself. He was named um, Richard Henry Sellers, but I believe he changed his name to Peter because he felt like he might be that other brother reincarnated. Take it for what it is. So Pagan Bill, I didn't say this either, Pagan Bill were vaudevillians. They were showbiz people and they had a show that, you know, they trooped around barely getting by as kind of a, I would say from, from ways described, kind of a half rate, not, not top of the line, but middle of the line entertainment duo or group. And for, so, so they, they had been, they were like a, a stage act. So another traumatic incident for Peter, Pe Peg and Bill, his mom and dad, saw their son as their best ticket to the theatrical Easy Street. So they're going to use their son to make money off of him. They thought that he was going to be the talent that they could kick, sit back, kick up their heels and collect money from their son, kind of pimp him out as an actor. So Peg and Bill saw their son as their best ticket to theatrical Easy Street, a role the son resented. Um, his aunt, once we, his aunt V, Auntie V recalled, they all thought this is where they would sit back and Peter will make a fortune. Defined at an early age, though, Peter refused to cooperate. Hired for five pounds to pose for an advertisement, he shunned all the photographer's directions and then flatly refused to take on any more modeling assignments. So he, he really didn't like it. He, it was deeply entrenched in his mind this was a he, he detested acting he detested entertainment believe it or not when he was uh when uh let's see here it says here baby peter was swept around with ray brothers limited and never had a home he was pressed into theatrical service at the age of two and a half when peg secured the little boy uh the little blonde boy into a cute white tie and tails outfit complete with a top hat, thrust a cane into his tiny hands and forced him on stage to sing the sappy Mile Dutch. The boy detested the bit and made his criticism phys physical by stomping on the hat. So I'm not going to go, you know, word for word throughout this whole podcast about this, but um, much of his early childhood trauma stems from his parents, stems from his mother, forcing him into show business, doting on him, and they, uh, the book also says he was very spoiled. He could do no wrong. You know, there's there's a story in the book where he actually, his aunt is bent over um, putting logs in the fire and he kicks her in the butt and knocks her into a burning fire. And the aunt is outraged and, you know, furious. And Peter doesn't get punished because his mother says, you know, basically boys will be boys. And so, so this kind of thing goes on into his regular life. So there's a number of stories, you know, I can pull out here where he threatened to kill one of the nannies, you know, he screamed and yelled at this one nanny and threatened to kill her. He, she had run up and hid in her room and she was so scared she jumped out the window. There's another um, whole incident where in, in another book by his son, Michael, well, where there were a family of mourning doves that had taken up nesting, taken up shelter above the front door of their mansion. And Peter was infuriated by these birds, and he went and got his, his shotgun, and he just blew these birds away right in front of Michael. Um, Peter Sellers, to give you the 50,000-foot 50, 50, overview, he was controlling, paranoid, jealous, superstitious, um, he was told by a famous actor that the color purple was superstitious and it was symbolic of death. So in one movie set, an actress came in, the lead, the lead actress came in wearing purple and he demanded she go home and change her clothes. Or she, she you know, as to wear a different color in the, in the movie, they had to change this entire movie because he thought that color purple represented death and he was going to die and things like that. So 
this was a guy that um, also, because he he felt he was this like rebirth of a of a previous brother that had died. He felt in one interview he said he didn't feel as if he even knew who he, who he really was. He took up shelter in the, in the characters he portrayed in all the films and the radio shows. But when he really sat down, he's like, you know, I'm not really sure who I am, you know. I'm a bit of a jiggy wicket. <laughs> and and I think that's kind of fascinating because here's a guy who world known for his portrayal of different characters. The off camera he was, you know, charming and stuff at times, but he could be a paranoid violent lunatic. And that's my point here. I mean, here's a man that made the world laugh, you know, made the world happy, made me happy at the very least. This is somebody that I admired, looked up to. This is somebody that I impersonated. I impersonated his characters. I was in Spectre Clouseau in eighth grade with Brian and uh, Dizia Dagebat, you know, and uh, all that stuff. And, and when I was a kid, I just assumed that the person they saw on screen was the person that he was at home or, uh, you know, at breakfast or in a movie. And like with any actor, they're playing a role, especially when they're being interviewed. They, they go into that role so they can put off the persona of, hey, I'm Peter Sellers. I'm going to talk like this and talk about my life as if it was all wonderful. You know, my wonderful mother. I'm not good at impersonating Peter, uh, the person, but... Um, and then all of us watch these interviews. It doesn't matter if it's Angelina Jolie or... Bruce Willis or, you know, uh, Tom Cruise or whoever the the latest heartthrobs are, they've all got a persona they put on when the the, the director says, you know, action. On goes the smile. On goes the pearly whites. You know, we're all happy. Jack Nicholson, hey, I'm on the side, like the sidelines of the Lakers, man. (laughs) Got my shades on. I'm doing it up. Jack Nicholson, man. You can handle the truth. Those aren't my sunglasses, are they? They aren't. So I don't know. And see, this is this podcast is more therapeutic for me because, quite frankly, I didn't I didn't realize any of this as a kid, and and maybe most kids don't. But the the more I find out about my heroes, about John Lennon, about Peter Sellers, about comedians that I grew up admiring, I, I'm huge on comedians. I was raised on comedians. The more I realize that, like, their comedy is one thing. If you hear any buzzing in the background, that's some maintenance people working on an office down the hall for me. Very exciting sound. Um, but but they're, they're, they're just not the real people. And, and these are not people. I don't think Peter Sellers is somebody you should look up to and admire as a person and say, Hey, Billy, little Billy, when you should grow up and be just like Peter Sellers. Okay, mom, you want me to shoot pigeons and morning does and threaten, threaten the nanny, say she's a fat cow and try to stab her to death with a knife? Oh, that's he went after the nanny with a knife. He plunged a knife into her bedroom door and she jumped out the window, the second story window and broke her ankle. This is a very unhinged individual. And I encourage you to get this book, but, but what I'm saying is if you've always admired and you stood up for it like I used to. I, I always use the Beatles as as an example because if anybody said anything bad about the Beatles to me, I'd be like, fuck you, man. You don't know the Beatles, man. They're the best group in the world, and they're nothing better, and they're nice guys, and they made me, the, you know, it was a really re- ridiculous adolescent, even as a 30-year-old man, an adolescent spew would come out of my mouth. You don't know what you're talking about, good music. But we're all like that. We'll stand behind our latest rap star, our latest hockey star, or football star, or soccer star, and oh, you don't know what they're like, you know. So he drinks a little bit on the side, you know. He beats his wife. It doesn't matter. He's a good football player. These are these are mostly dirt bags. These are people that you wouldn't want in your house. You know, I don't think I'd want anything to do with John Lennon if he was if he walked into my house. I, I don't know if I'd want to. I don't know. I don't think much of the guy anymore. I don't. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of inconsistencies in these in these people's lives that I don't think you should admire. Maybe admire their comedy and, and admire their art. 
But let's put it this way. If, if you would adv- admire Van Gogh's art, do you like that man's work so much that you cut off your own ear? If, if a hooker told you to, you know, cause allegedly cut off his ear and gave it to some hooker because he thought that would impress her or something. I know that impressed me if I was a hooker. Oh, look, he gave me his ear. Oh, I'm so excited. The bottom line to this this whole podcast is this. And what I've always said all along is all we have is each other. That's all we got. The government doesn't give a crap about you. Right now they got you looking at the skies, thinking there's flying saucers up there and they're shooting they're shooting unidentified objects out of the sky. And they're coming from China. The new enemy is China. It's not the Ukraines or the Russians, now it's the Chinese, and they've got floating balloons above Montana. They're shooting lasers into our missile silos. It's scary stuff. The government doesn't care about you. Hollywood doesn't care about you. The government wants your tax dollars. Hollywood wants your hard-earned dollars. They want you to buy their tickets and their movies and their seats at the Super Bowl. They want you to buy their music. They don't care about you. If you got hit by a bus tomorrow, do you think Elton John would show up at your house and say, I'm sorry, love, I'm sorry your mother got hit by a bus? That's bloody awful, isn't it? Yes. Do you think so? Do you think Angelina would show up with her big giant lips at your house if your dad died? These people don't give a shit about you. They don't care who you are. They don't know who you are. They don't want to know. They just want to make sure you keep buying their tickets and buying their products. Same with Peter Sellers. He didn't give a shit who any of you were. This guy was fucked up in the head. And as I said, I, I don't want to go into the, into the weeds and the woods and the bushes about this book. It's a very detailed book. And uh, I, I can give you all kinds of scenarios and stories and examples to back it up with. Oh, for instance, Peter's wife first, Peter's first wife was Anne Hayes. Anne Hayes was an actress and a very talented actress. And he demanded she give up acting because Peter didn't want any competition between the two of them as actors. He wanted all the attention on him. That's very odd. I don't know if, I'm not a counselor, I don't know if it's psychotic or neurotic or a combination of the two, but it's something really um, unhealthy. Her, his wife, Anne Hayes, is quoted as saying, he was immoral, dangerous, vindictive, totally selfish, and yet he had the charm of the devil. So he, it almost sounds psychopathic. He, he would come in, charm people, get them to like him, and then, then he'd unleash his wrath upon them, especially his wives. He treated his wives like dogs. Um, on, a, on another chapter, he would kind of hold people hostage, threatening to kill himself. He called up his mother once. Said, hello, man, I'm go back, going down to the tubes. I'm going to throw myself in front of a train. Ta-ta for now. You know, and, he, and he, you know, she's, she's horrified. So she runs down to the subway and finds him sitting there by the tracks on a bench, just looking blankly into the darkness. I mean, can you imagine getting a call from one of your kids and saying, hey, I'm about to kill myself. See you later. I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd be, just, it would destroy you if that had happened, especially if they, if they, um, carried it out. He did a lot of really odd things. But what I'm saying here is all we have is each other. That's been the mantra of my podcast is that, you know, if if you invest all of your heart and your soul into Hollywood and in the media and you believe everything the presidents and the queens and the kings say, and you really believe that there's nasty, wasty bugs out there that are going to infect you, you need to get virus shots, you need to get go hide from flying saucers in the sky. They've got all of us running scared, running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And unfortunately, most of the things that we've they've said was scary and nasty and horrifying isn't there. It's not happened. I haven't seen it materialize. Maybe some of you have. I have I've known some people who've gotten COVID, but they didn't die from it. And they weren't nearly as sick as they were told they were going to get. So let me ask you this. Do you think 
right now, if you turned off your TV and you logged onto your cell phone and you stopped going on Facebook and you stopped watching national and local news, do you think that would really hurt your life or would it enhance it? Because I'll tell you right now, my wife and I have stopped watching news completely. We don't watch, we haven't watched, well, I personally haven't watched the national news in oh, like eight years. And I haven't watched, we haven't watched the local news in about three months. We stopped watching local news. Because the local news likes to scare you too. The local news during the big cold spell that moved through the states around Christmas time. The local news lady, uh, her name is Betsy Kling. She's like, be very scared. It's going to be very cold. Some of you could die. Oh, my God. Get your space heaters. Make sure you have enough oil. Make sure you have enough gas, enough food. It could be very scary. And my wife freaked out. She completely freaked out. She believed every word that this woman said. And and my wife almost had a breakdown. It was horrifying to watch. I didn't know what to I'd never seen. My wife is very even keel. Very even keel, very focused, intelligent, rational. And this is the first time I think ever I've seen her just completely lose it. And so nothing happened. We survived. Our furnace did have some problems, but we had space heaters and, you know, we were protected. But I had to sit down with her and say, we've got to stop watching the news. We've got to stop watching the weather because you freaked out over that. And that's not healthy. It's not right. They got to you. They freaked you out. Hollywood is getting to each and every one of you too. They're scaring you right now with China. Where every time I turn on YouTube, it's like there's nuclear war. Talk of nuclear war from Russia. Oh, we blew up, blew up the the Russian pipeline into Germany or something. Oh, there's gonna be war, war, war. I've been talking like that since I was a little kid. I I'm 57. I can remember back at least to 1970. Them talking about. The Vietnam War and Russia and what was his name? Brezhnev. Brezhnev was going to come over and beat us with his big furry eyebrows and nuke us. They had us all looking to the sky for bombers and missiles. Meantime, the communists all infiltrated our country. While our eyes were up here, they came in and got into our Congress. They got into our Senate. They got into our local governments. The, the communists and the socialists are everywhere now. They're trying to turn the country over to a communist socialistic state of some sort. They're trying to take our guns away. They're trying to take our freedoms away. You can't say anything you want to say. Meantime, we're still up here going, oh, there's Chinese balloons. Oh, oh, oh look, there's one there. Oh, it's dropping lasers and bombs on us. No, that's not going to happen, people. They've already taken over. The only thing we have left is each other. And if we let them take that from us, you know, we got you got nothing. What I'm asking each of you to do is think about your life. Think about what's truly important. Your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, your pets, that's what's important. Not not fame. I'm not famous. And I'm never gonna be famous. I mean YouTube has made that blatantly clear to me. They're never gonna let me become famous. They're taking my money away, they're taking my exposure away, even though I'm getting more and more views and more and more subscribers, my money's going way down. They don't want me around. They cut me out, brother. They're pushing me away. They're shadow banning me. They're not shadow banning me, but they're they don't want me to make any money. It's not about the money. It's about the message. And if you can think about this, think about how much easier your life would be if you didn't have the media in Hollywood trying to tell you how to think trying to tell you what's good and what's bad and what's nice and what's evil. They've all got agendas. All the movies today have agendas. You know, we're watching this TV show called Tul Tulsa King, you know, with Sylvester Stallone. And I'm watching this thing, you know, and I'm like, what the hell, you know? What's this, movie, this show really about? It's okay. Again, another show where they're stereotyping Italians as being mafias, mafiosa, you know? You know, mafiosa dudes that are out there breaking kneecaps and shooting people cap and putting a cap in somebody's ass, you know. And that's what it's all about, you know. And the show is like, what is this about anyway? And I'm watching it, and there's a scene where he goes into this pot store, and he basically extorts the owner of the pot store to give him $5,000 a month of his profits. 
because the guy's pulling in over like a million dollars a year in pot sales and it's all under the table cash. And I'm like, is he trying to, is there an agenda here? Because it's kind of weird that they're talking about these pot stores. What's the agenda behind this show? This is, the, this is how I look at shows. Now, what's the agenda behind What's the real message behind it? You know, first 48 TV show about cops all over the country that, and real murders, real life stories of people getting killed and the cops say the first 48 hours is the most important time to solve a murder because after that time your your return or your chances of finding the people that did the murder are, are diminished greatly, exponentially. But this basically is is a show that says crime doesn't pay. Don't do this, you know. There's bad guys out there, especially don't go to Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Don't go to Tulsa, you know. You'll get shot by some guy who's driving by in a Cadillac, you know. And um, there's all these shows out there now. I'm like, well, what's what's the point to them? And, and and I don't believe that they are sanitized productions where somebody just wants to write a nice story about a Western or a, a mafia guy. I mean, they always portray the mafia as these dirtbags that are killing each other and they're, they're angry and they're lost world, you know, and they're really, you know, Gotta do all this stuff to make some cash for my mama. My mama mia, you know. My mozzarella cheese. So everything's got an agenda. The, the news is there to scare you. Hollywood is pushing agendas on you. Most of these movies have messages, sub, sub, subconscious, subliminal, or conscious, right out in your face messages. Like this most recent Top Gun movie with Tom Cruise, we saw that. Oh my God, that thing was like. The biggest pile of horseshit, an F-18 Hornet, making all these wild maneuvers. I mean, that, that jet is like 40 years old or something. I don't think I could handle the kind of G's that was pulling that movie. But it basically, it's propaganda, military propaganda to get kids to want to join the Air Force. Because it looks like fun. Hey, Dad, can I drive, fly an F-18 through the canyons and go kill bad guys? <laughs> yeah. There's an agenda behind it. A huge agenda. But, uh, but, 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 uh, I'm PT Pop, and uh, just think about it. Think about what you're watching. Think about the people you admire. Think about the messages that they're conveying and the messages that are conveys. Is it, is it healthy? Is it real? Is it something you really should take a second look at? Take a look at the meaning behind the films you see on the radio shows and the songs you hear. So... With that, I would check out Mr. Sykoff's book, Mr. Strangelove, uh, a, biogra a biography of Peter Sellers. It's a great book. It's a long book. You'll learn a lot about Peter Sellers that maybe you didn't want to know. <laughs> he, was a, he was a pretty wacky, wacky dude. So I'm sending off. Check out my movie, Road to Forgiveness. It's out right now on YouTube. And I appreciate all of you who listen. Have a good day. Take care. And uh, you know what? You've been listening to Into PC Pop, a mind revolution, leading you out of the rabbit hole. Let me do that again. You've been listening to You have been listening to PC Pop, a mind revolution, leading you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. I'll be the same, baby.